first uh, webinar back to the end of January. Welcome back. Uh, hopefully that, that uh, what you learned the first time will help, uh, help follow and get more out of this one. If you weren't on the first one, a little background about myself. Uh, I am a senior application scientist with uh, Bruker uh, Nano Surfaces, the um, Tribology Mechanical Testing Group. Previously, I spent 22 years at Battelle Memorial Institute solving uh, practical tribology problems, applied tribology problems for both industry and government. And a lot of my experience has gone into this uh, particular presentation. So hopefully, uh, we'll have some real world uh, experience here and, and some examples that will help you guys uh, characterize your tribal system so you can do the right kind of tribal test to get the answer you want. So the elements, first I'm going to go through the elements of the tribal system, and there are five of them. But the first question we always have to ask ourselves or our colleagues or our, uh, anybody we're working with or discussing with, with is what is the intended application? And knowing the application helps us select the tribal elements we need to incorporate in the tribal test. And I've listed five here, uh, and there are many other ways to do this. Uh, Horst Chikos had a very nice uh, layout. He had a very long two-pager. Uh, in 1978, the Tribology series book by Elsevier. But my five, which then have subcategories, are materials, contact geometry, loading, motion, and environment. And if we consider each of these five things uh, and what's important in them, we can both define the tribal test because we've characterized the tribal system. So let's examine each of these in more detail and list, try to list all the possible contributing factors which define a tribal system. And the good news is we won't have to do all these, but if we, if we consider them, some are more important than others, and in certain tests, if you miss one, you could be in trouble getting the wrong answer afterwards. So we'll start with materials. Um, and we'll start with solid bodies or monolithic bodies. And remember from the first webinar, and if you, uh, if you didn't see it, it is available online at the uh, Bruker.com website, and I think Sarah will provide a link to that. But the solid bodies, really have uh, a number of things on their surfaces, oxides, coatings, lubricants, absorb layers, and contaminants. And so when we consider solid bodies, we must also consider each of these uh, items because, for example, thin coatings are going to be better characterized by a scratch or a nano indentation test, and thick coatings, like a hard facing or something, by maybe a rubbing or abrasion test. Uh, oxides and absorb layers can be important for initial friction measurements uh, and, or contributing to a tribal layer or even affecting a galling threshold stress study. So you may need to run a sufficient number of cycles to uh, reach a steady state in that regard. And by contaminants, I mean really handling or manufacturing oils or other substances that just get absorbed or put on the surface as a, as a matter of course um, during the production or handling of the material, uh, including our test samples in the lab. So now the second part, besides uh, uh, rigid bodies or monolithic bodies, are loose particles. And we need to consider a number of things with loose particles, including their composition. Is it, a, is it a silica? Is it alumina? Uh, those have different hardnesses. Uh, what is their size distribution? What is their shape and angularity? All of those things affect the wear rate that's, that's going to be measured. Uh, if we happen to have a slurry, like we see here in this uh, drilling mud, we worry about the concentration in the, steer, in the slurry. Those are things that are important, uh, in addition to the particle hardness and shape and type. Uh, if we're making materials to resist uh, erosive wear, not only, again, the concentration and the velocity, but the angle of impact is really important here. Uh, high angles of impact, we would choose a different material to resist a high angle of impact, such as a soft or compliant material, because it's a more of a fatigue and fracture phenomenon. Uh, versus a low angle of impact where we'd want uh, more of a hard material. So these things in a gas stream or a fluid stream um, are important in the angle of impact. So those are things we consider on the materials side. When we get to contact geometry, now we worry about the macroscopic geometry and the microscopic contact geometry. Uh, in macroscopic, I can characterize this in maybe a flat on flat, which would be a typical example of a, is a disc break or say a gate valve between the seat and the seat ring. Uh, in a conformal contact, now we have two curved surfaces, and this could be a drum brake, curve against curve, a plug valve, or a journal bearing. And you can imagine in a drum brake, uh, initially when you first put the, the shoes on, they may not, or the brake pads on, they may not have an exact conformality with the brake drum, so the friction, in fact, will be lower because you just have less contact area. So we worry about things like that. 
in, uh, in conformal contacts. Are we really conformal initially, and do we get to conformality? Uh, and then non-conformal, we have things like a point contact, a line contact, which might be a cylinder on its side, or an elliptical contact uh, for an egg-shaped or oval-shaped or a, a, a dual radius, radii uh, contact. That's an elliptical contact. Surface finish now is our microscopic geometry of contact. And in this case, we worry about uh, all, the, the, all the kinds of values you can measure. R sub A, R sub Q, the root mean squared roughness. RA is the uh, arithmetic mean roughness. We worry about bearing area, peak shape, valley volume, or lay the directionality of the marks. And here we can see in the right-hand image a cross home cylinder. And that's a deliberate roughness to carry lubricant uh, as the ring passes over there to carry the lubricant up to the top and keep that interface lubricated. So surface finish in the micro geometry is important. And finally, we get to edge conditions. And these can be sharp uh, as machined or stamped or edged burr. We really try and avoid those. And in most cases, we do. But in some cases, those exist. So we might want to put a chamfer or radius on. But to the extent possible, the samples should be finished in the same manner as the real life components. If you're doing a test in the lab, and it was a grit blast sample, you want to have, uh, sorry, a grit blast uh, um, engineering application, you want to have a grit blast surface. Loading is our third area of interest. So we look at the macroscopic again. What is the contact stress? Is it an elastic stress? If so, we can do Hertzian calculations. These are available online. They're available on our software, on the Bruker software. Um, if it's a plastic, that's usually from sliding contact because we, we go out of the elastic region and then you can calculate the stress from the area and the load. Uh, the stress then can also be a steady increasing or decreasing. Here's a gate valve and depending on if it's opening or closing, we would have a variable load. In the closing direction, it's increasing as the delta pressure across the valve builds up. As you open it, you have a decreasing load. So you might want to simulate that in your test to see if you're materials of choice will function if they're put on this gate valve, seat ring, and, uh, and disc. You can have variable loading, such as in this cam follower, where as you change the, the height, that spring changes the load. You can have a fixed direction load, such as a rolling element bearing, where always the weight of the shaft or whatever the force is, is in the same direction. Or you can have an oscillating load, such as the pendulum, where the, the point of contact changes. And so we need to consider that in our test if we're testing materials or coefficient of friction measurements or wear or lifetime. Changes in loading can also come from changes in speed or changes in temperature, which can cause changing clearances. This is something we, we often forget is if we do room temperature tests, uh, what happens in real life if we get to higher temperature and our clearances change, that's going to change the loading conditions. The fourth thing of, con of concern is our motion. We can have a continuous motion. We can have a start-stop motion, and that's usually more severe uh, than a continuous motion because we go, if you remember the Strybeck curve, and I'll show you this uh, later on, uh, we can go from, from more hydrodynamic or fully hydrodynamic back down into the boundary regime, and wear is going to happen much more readily in the boundary regime than in the hydrodynamic. So start-stop is worse than continuous. Uh, unidirectional is different than reciprocating because you can start and stop in the same direction, say going around in a circle starting and stopping, or reciprocating. Now I'm changing the direction of sliding and starting and stopping. And the duty cycle is our fourth motion uh, consideration, and that's the dwell time between sliding events. So I'll show an example. I think it's a crane rail wheel where the flanges on the, uh, on the wheel and the rail come in contact, but it's, it's not all the time. The, the, the uh, crane may move down to one end of the shop sit there for a few minutes or a few hours and then move back to the other end. So you have a duty cycle where there's much more rest in between the, the actual rubbing. You have other cases where something is functioning all the time and therefore the duty cycle is, is near 100%. So we might want to consider that in a wear test. And again, that can help us uh, calculate the wear coefficient. If we shorten the duty cycle so we can speed up the test, we just need to consider the actual duty cycle uh, to do our wear coefficient calculation. And finally, the fifth uh, area of concern in, in characterizing the tribal system is environment. And by environment, I'm going to refer to the temperature, the humidity, the pressure, and that can be ambient. Most of our tests are done in ambient pressure because most of our tribal systems operate in ambient, but we also have to consider uh, vacuum for space 
considerations or high pressure for uh, piping systems and nuclear systems and such. And then again, do we have a liquid environment? And if we do have a liquid environment, is it an electrolyte? Do we have to worry about uh, tribal corrosion factors? So those are the five factors. And um, I think now what I'd like to do is, is talk about defining the tribal test. What do we really need to know within those five factors? So again, start by asking your question, what is the intended application? And then we're going to determine what are the important parameters in the specific areas of materials, contact geometry, loading, motion, and environment. And I think as I go through my examples, um, I'll probably combine two of these, so we'll really only have four, get it down to that area. But let me give you an example um, of, of why we might care about uh, various things. So not everything is going to have an important or measurable effect. So we, we fortunately can be pragmatic and thorough at the same time. An example, I love steel. I'm a metallurgist by training. Um, is uh, let's talk about steel. So, for example, just material, and then I'll go into specific examples where I cover all of the all of the five areas. Do we need the exact heat treatment? Because steel is not steel, as we remember. If we saw the first webinar, uh, there was a, a back and forth with a colleague who needed the coefficient of friction of steel, and and uh, we we got into what all you need to know about the steel and the system to be able to determine the coefficient of friction. Because steel, as a reminder as a material does not have a coefficient of friction. Friction is a system property, not a materials property. So do I need the exact heat treatment? Well, if it's an abrasive wear situation and our abradance hardness is near that of the steel in its heat treated condition, then we better use the same heat treatment on our sample so we can determine what the wear rate will be with this abrading. On the other hand, if it's a situation, if we're running fully hydrodynamic, then the heat treatment doesn't really matter because I'm, I'm not really contacting. But in start-stop, I am. So therefore, replicating the surface finish is important because that's going to tell me where I am in my lambda ratio calculation. And that's another thing you can review from the, from the first webinar. So there are cases where I really need to worry about the heat treatment. And there are others where I don't. So understanding the system um, tells us, and the application tells us if we have to worry about those things. Okay. Well, I'm going to go through, as time permits, uh, about a half a dozen or so examples, because I would like to leave time for questions at the end here. So let's get started. Uh, here's a list. I may not get to all of these, but uh, we'll go through them one at a time and, and see, uh, see how we do. So this is example one, and it's a, it's a wheel on rail. And um, I guess I got one A and one B, so I'm sort of cheating here. But the first one is a railroad wheel. So I want to define these five areas, materials, contact geometry, loading, motion, and environment, and say to myself, what is important in each of these tribal elements? So for materials, certainly the alloy steel is, is what's used. Uh, so we need to know its composition, its heat treatment, its hardness, and depending on the heat treatment, if there's a case depth or not. Is it through hardened or is it not through hardened? For contact geometry, uh, what we have is a non-conformal line contact. So that's something like a large disc on its edge against a flat. And my, my train wheel has a half meter radius. I, I figure the wheel's about a meter high, and it's about a 75 millimeter contact width. That's the contact, be, that's the macro contact between my wheel and rail. And my surface roughness, uh, really I think below a maximum value is probably unimportant because it becomes quite polished due to mild abrasion and plastic deformation of the asperities. So, Surface roughness isn't something I'm going to consider a, a, an important uh, contact geometry uh, tribal element factor. Loading, uh, the railroad guys tell me it's 25 tons per axle, so I can do a Hertzian contact calculation. I'll show you that on the next slide. Uh, that comes out to be um, 111,000 newtons on a wheel, and I get about 322 megapascal contact stress. So even though I say loading here, what I'm really after is to get down to the stress, because that's what I want to replicate in my laboratory test. The motion is rolling contact. There may be some side slip as we go around corners, but primarily it's unidirectional. I'll base the speed on a one meter diameter wheel, and this train is running 200 kilometers per hour. So it's a reasonably high speed train. Environment is whatever you find on the railroad tracks. It's normally dry, but it certainly can be wet with water or other contaminants. Oxides are not likely to be important, and we're running over the range of ambient outdoor temperatures. 
Um, I've also read some papers where people have put uh, wet leaves and other things and sand. There's all kinds of debris. Whatever you find on the railroad track, um, that may be of interest in your laboratory study. But uh, primarily, if we're interested in uh, rolling contact fatigue, um, that's what we're trying to simulate. So that's the parameter of interest is coefficient of friction and rolling contact fatigue. So here's a, a calculation. Uh, th this sort of thing, again, it's available on the web. This is on our, our um, uh, Bruker viewer software. And you, you put in things uh, such as the, the um, uh, radius of the wheel, the uh, elastic moduli, Poisson's ratio uh, for both body A and B. And in this case, body B, I've, I've checked there flat. So it has essentially an infinite radius. And that's where I got these numbers. 111,000 newtons is what the load uh, was, it was imposed by the uh, 25 tons per axle. And you end up with a calculation of about 322 megapascals. So that's what we're interested in our lab simulation. And now I'm going to define the tribal test, because I want to know the coefficient of friction, and I want rolling contact fatigue, and maybe slip if I want to get that fancy. So my materials, I'm going to choose the same alloy steel, composition, heat treatment, hardness, case depth. I, I need to have the same as that as, uh, as in my wheel and rail contact. My geometry is a non-conformal line contact. In this case, the only way I can get that same stress without applying 110,000 newtons, which I can't do on my local machine, is do roller on roller. And, but I can still do the Hertzian contact. And if I take, for example, here you can see I've got a 100 millimeter diameter, which is a, a 50 millimeter radius wheel. I've got two of those, same bulk modulus, same Poisson's ratio. I can put a load on of 900 newtons, which is easily doable in the lab, and I get 324 megapascals. So now I'm at the same contact stress as I am in the real life situation. So I've got rolling contact. Uh, the, the dilemma I have here is that the speed to simulate a 200 kilometer per hour train on a four inch wheel or a 100 millimeter wheel is I need to go about 10,000 RPM. It's not something I can do very readily in the lab. Uh, there are specially built machines that can do that with larger radii diameters, so they use a smaller speed. But in this case, I'm interested in contact fatigue so I can run 5,000 RPM, and if I do that, it, it just means I have to run the test twice as long, and that's something I'm willing to accept and not having to build a, a very specific huge machine so I can get that kind of speed out of larger wheels and higher loads, of course. So I can do this. I just have to run twice as long. My environment, in the lab, I can run dry, again, wet with water contaminants, and uh, ambient outdoor temperature may or may not matter. We're going to start things at, at room temperature. That's really what we want. We want to measure friction. I can measure wear and cycles to a fatigue failure. So here's, here's sort of a lab setup. You can see the roller on roller. It's, it's uh, in there. I can put 1,000 newtons on here and easily get the same type of contact stress. So that's what we can do in the lab to simulate that uh, railroad application. So here's 1B. And this is, again, wheel on rail, but it's a little bit different. I'm not going high speed where I worry about fatigue. This is a low speed. This is an overhead crane. And often in overhead cranes, uh, especially in steel mills and, and rolling plants, large production facilities, I've got independent motors driving the left side and the right side of the crane. And it's very hard to keep those synchronized precisely. So you get kind of a walking back and forth, a ratcheting back and forth of, of the left side wheels and the right side wheels. And they tend to scrub. And that's why you have a double flanged wheel as shown there. They scrub on the rail. So now I've got this contact at the, at the uh, side of the, of the uh, rail and the flange of the wheel. But again, if you look at that, the duty cycle on the wheel is only going to be about 15 20%. Each time that wheel goes around, it's only in contact at the bottom. And then we have to figure out what is the motion there um, when we get to defining the, the tribal system. So uh, what are the tribal elements? Uh, it's an alloy steel, again, just like the railroad. Uh, we worry about composition, heat treatment, hardness, and case depth. But in this case, we're concerned about wear of those flanges and not necessarily about fatigue. So we may want to put a coating on them or try something, maybe a lubricant, maybe a coating, to reduce uh, the amount of wear. So that's going to be my materials in my tribal system. Contact geometry is flat sliding or kind of a scrubbing. My best estimate was that it was about 13 square centimeters of area in contact there between those wheel flanges and the sides of that rail. Uh, surface roughness, again, it's unimportant. It becomes worn 
due to the moderate abrasion or adhesion, so that's not such a big issue. Um, loading, I was unable to determine the stress. My best estimate was based on the contact area and that there's a load somewhere between 10 and 45 kilonewtons, so I'm somewhere between 7.5 and, and 35 megapascals. So that's my loading I'm going to try and apply because I think that's what's there in real life. Um, if somebody had a lot of money uh, and time and, and uh, perseverance, they could strain gauge the outside of that wheel and maybe determine what the forces are on the inside by looking at the bending. But I think a good engineering estimate gets us pretty close. Uh, for the motion, I've got sliding contact. It is bidirectional because the point on near the rim of the flange, on the inside of that flange, is first going down and then going up as the rolling occurs. Uh, sometimes you see this on a bicycle at night with a single reflector near the rim. You can see that uh, scallop pattern or like the, the ribs of an umbrella in profile. And I'm going to base the speed on a 600 millimeter diameter wheel uh, rolling along at a, a travel speed of one meter per second. Uh, typically it's dry environment. Uh, oxides are probably unimportant. Maybe there's some mill dust depending on where this uh, crane is uh, being used and it's usually ambient shock temperature. So I don't really have to go to very low temperature or very high temperature. Uh, it's probably something I can do in the lab at uh, ambient temperature. So again, uh, let's define the tribal test. I, I've got sliding wear. That's what I'm interested in. I've got a, abrasive and adhesive wear. And I'm interested in how can I make that flange last longer. So I may want to try various heat treatments for the steel, different from the original one, because again, I'm screening. Uh, or maybe various coatings. I, I would probably look at thick overlays like a hard facing because it's unlikely a thin coating like we see in some other industries like a DLC, a diamond like carbon, it, it's really unlikely that, that a five or less micron thick coating is going to last in this industrial application. I'm going to do flat on flat sliding because that's what the flange against the side of the rail is. I'm going to run tests in the estimated service range again of 15 to 70 megapascals, something like that. If we look at that picture right above there, you can see that a point on the rim uh, or near the rim of the, of the flange on the wheel, it, it goes down and goes up. So it really is sort of a reciprocating motion back and forth as, uh, as that point comes in, in contact or that point reaches the bottom of the rolling cycle. So I want to do reciprocating sliding contact. I estimate it's about a 40 millimeter stroke if I look at the bottom of that flange again, uh, maybe a 15 percent duty cycle. Uh, my sliding distance is based on the service life. Uh, I'm going to estimate I go five traverses per day of a full rail length, 200 meters for a year, and the speed I calculate at the bottom there of about 25 millimeters per second. So that's what I'm going to set up in my tribal test because I believe that that describes the tribal system. I'll do it dry. If we really care to, you could add some mill dust if it's important, and I would use a normal lab temperature again. So that's the test I'd run. And again, you just simply calculate how many cycles do I need for a one-year life, uh, five traverses per day of 200 meters, and you calculate that and you run that number of tests, measure the wear, calculate the wear coefficient, and uh, you can compare different heat treatments or different coatings. Example two, uh, and I don't have an A or B here, this will just be one example, uh, break and clutch materials. And here's another very common one, but we need to do some screening in the lab keeping in mind that the real test for this tribal system is on the vehicle itself. There is nothing we can do in the lab um, short of a large uh, inertial dynamometer to get really the exact friction and wear, and we still don't get the noise, harshness, and vibration, and VH, as they know. You can't get that from a lab test, so we, we admit right up front, all we're doing is screening materials. And when we screen materials, we just want to make sure we're representative so we've got a large enough sample that in something as inhomogeneous as a brake or a clutch material, we're sampling you know, the typical microstructure. Okay? So that's something to keep in mind. This is only for screening materials. We, we can't say that what we get in the lab will be able to allow us to predict the stopping of that vehicle. We know that, but we can compare a number of, uh, of materials, uh, at least in the lab, and see how they perform friction and wear uh, in the tests we're setting up. So, our materials are our friction material, usually versus cast iron, in some cases versus steel. I suppose if you can afford a Porsche or a high-end car, maybe versus ceramic, but uh, I'm going to say 99% of the market out there is cast iron. 
Our geometry is either flat on flat or conformal, but um, typically flat on flat is much easier to run, so that's what we're going to think about. And most of the brakes these days are disc brakes. Uh, you still see drum brakes on big trucks in North America, but uh, not everywhere else in the world. Our loading from my colleagues in the brake fields, they tell me they're from two to five megapascals for cars, maybe one for a really small car, uh, but for big trucks, heavy duty vehicles, it's seven to 10 megapascals. So we'd like to try and be in that range if we can in the lab, but again, we're limited with load and with speed and with torque, so we'll get as close as we can uh, understanding that, again, we're just screening materials. My motion is purely sliding. It's primarily unidirectional. Uh, I'm going to base my maximum speed on a 15 to 20 centimeter diameter rotor. So this is a car, not a truck, at a vehicle speed of 100 kilometers per hour, or about 60 miles an hour. That's my tribo system. My environment is dry or wet. And again, my thermal condition is important. So I'm going to want to control that or monitor that. And typically, when they run brake fade and recovery tests, you'll, you'll run a stop, it'll get up to some high temperature, and then they'll wait till it cools down to some moderate temperature, 38 degrees C or 100 F, called IBT, initial brake temperature, uh, before they start the next stop. And they might do 100 of those, and then compare the friction before and after in such a stop, and the wear during after those 100 cycles. So in defining the tribo test, again, material screening only, and the reason we want to do this is there are cases uh, I know the state of Washington has already enacted this. I believe California is either underway or similarly. No more copper in brake materials. And there's only about 3% copper, maybe 3 to 5% copper fibers put in, uh, both as a strengthener and as a, as a uh, heat, uh, heat conductor source. Um, so they don't want copper in, so now you've got to replace that 3% copper with something else. Well, in the, in the 20 component composition of brake, friction, or clutch materials, uh, you might want to say, well, let me try 2% aluminum, 1% magnesium, or 1% aluminum, 2% magnesium, or maybe I use iron, or maybe I use aramid. You know, there's a lot of different compositions you can try, and rather than test those on a vehicle, you want to do your screening in a lab. So that's what we're going to do is material screening, a bunch of different friction materials versus cast iron, same contact geometry, flat on flat. I would probably use a three-button test because that's more stable than a pin on disc type test. I can put much higher load on it. But again, to be of uniform microstructure or, or representative microstructure, I probably don't want to go any smaller than 1.5 centimeters in diameter for each of my three buttons. So using that, that contact size, knowing, knowing I have three buttons, I want to go between two and five megapascal of constant load, or I can do a varying load if I'm running a constant torque test. There's a number of things you can do if you have load control and uh, feedback loop control on your test rig. Um, motion is going to be purely unidirectional sliding. I'd probably run multiple slop stops, again, from maximum speed down to zero, 100 stops, or whatever. Simulates something they do on the real car. Again, I'm just in the lab, and I'm just screening materials, but I'm going to compare A to B to C to D, all of them in the same test. Uh, I do this dry. I do multiple stops, again, with my IBT below 38 degrees C because that's, that's what they ask for in the next round of testing uh, on either an inertial dynamometer or in, in the car. So that's how I'd simulate that in the lab. Uh, I need to know what kind of load. If I assume a coefficient of friction of something like 0.4, I know the automakers are trying to get to 0.5 and stable so they can have smaller components. The smaller the components, the lighter the vehicle, the better the fuel economy. That's very important these days. So I just need to make sure I got my load and my torque with a calculation of one and a half centimeter diameter button, three of them, and whatever stress, uh, two to five megapascals that I've chosen. I'm going to review here. I don't know how many of you uh, saw the, the first uh, um, webinar, but I want one slide on the Strybeck curve because my next two examples will deal with uh, uh, the lubrication regime of a journal bearing. So here's a Strybeck curve, and if we look We've got a plot of the coefficient of friction, and you can see four orders of magnitude there from 0 0.001 up to 1. Uh, and then at the bottom, you have what's called the Hersey number, which is speed times viscosity divided by load. We're going to ignore viscosity for the moment and just consider speed and load. And what you see on the blue curve is that on the left-hand side, you're in the boundary regime, which means you're 
speed is low and your load is high, so you're probably rubbing the asperities and mostly or the boundary film on the asperities between the two surfaces. As I increase my speed and or decrease my load, I move towards the right and we get into a regime where we're starting to get more and more support of the fluid as I build up the pressure, as I draw it into that converging gap. Um, and then I can fully support that journal uh, as I get down to that very low regime. And on the right-hand side, we're in thick film or the hydrodynamic regime. So depending on what region you're interested in, if you're a, a um, lubricant manufacturer and now you're looking at additives for boundary film formation, then you're going to be interested in the left-hand side. So you want to do a test that, that uh, accentuates or, or focuses on the left-hand side, the boundary regime. If you're a manufacturer of lubricants who's really working on VI characteristics, viscosity, viscosity pressure, viscosity temperature, then you're interested in the right-hand side. So you're going to want to set up a lab test where you're looking and you're, you're more readily in the right-hand side. So that's a, a quick review of the Strybeck curve, which just basically describes for given conditions uh, whether you're in boundary or mixed or hydrodynamic regime and, and why we want to focus our test on one side or the other. So my, my next two examples, the first one will be in the hydrodynamic bearing, so that's going to be the right-hand side of the, uh, the Strybeck curve. My materials, almost always it's a steel journal. Most commonly they're chrome-plated, so you'd want to do that if that was the case. And my counterface is a, a Babbitt, which is a soft... Uh, 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 bronze or tin material so that during touchdown and takeoff, this is a very common in automobile uh, main crankshaft bearings, I don't have scoring or galling. That's a very compliant material and it, it can take that. Uh, or simply a bronze bearing uh, without the Babbitt uh, coating on it. Uh, my contact geometry is conformal. Again, I have a converging gap because I need to build up that, that wedge, that pressure uh, to lift off the journal. My surface roughness typically in this case is pretty smooth, 0.1 to 0.2 microns R sub A, arithmetic mean roughness. Uh, finer is probably better in this case, but that's about a good practical limit uh, for not paying too much money for, for super finishing. My loading on a, on a main crankshaft is oh, 100 to 200, uh, sorry, 1 to 200 kilograms on the two main bearings, and those are going to be something like 50 millimeters in diameter and 20 millimeters wide about a 2 megapascal contact stress is what I calculate using those numbers. Again, you, you just calculate the contact stress with that load on one of the bearings over that area. It's a pretty simple calculation. In this case, it's not a Hertzian calculation. It's just load divided by area. So I'm looking to sim simulate 2 megapascals. My motion is going to be unidirectional rotation of the shaft. My speed, oh, typically in a, in a crankshaft, is going to vary from 0 to roughly 6,000 RPM. It can be plus or minus, but that's what I'd like to be able to uh, uh, emulate that speed. And again, it's not the RPM, but it's the sliding speed in my test. My environment will be a liquid lubricant. My possible temperature range is that typical of automotive. They talk about, because there are way in the north of Sweden and the north of Alaska in some places, uh, minus 40 degree C mornings, and 105 C is about as high as uh, your, uh, your water jacket will let you get with, uh, with uh, antifreeze or, or coolant in there. So that's the environment I might want to run under. If I define the tribo test, again, I'm interested in the right-hand side of the Strybeck curve. I'm going to use the same material, a steel journal. Uh, I'll have as my counterface either a Babbitt or a bronze bushing. If I'm running fully hydrodynamic and I don't care about the boundary characteristic, excuse me, then I can probably use steel on both as long as I replicate the surface roughness on both contacts. My geometry is a converging gap. I could use a cylinder on side versus a flat disk. That is essentially the same geometry. Uh, I probably have to run a bit different speeds and loads because it's not a fully conformal converging gap like a, a journal inside of a, a bushing. Um, but cylinder on side versus a flat gives me that same wedge. I want to replicate the surface roughness of 0.1 to 0.2 microns in my microgeometry. My loading is going to be what I need to do to develop a Strybeck curve because then, depending on the sample size and geometry and relative speed of interface, I can look at different lubricants under these same conditions once I develop my Strybeck curve uh, looking at the different lubricants. So typically, 
if I have a fairly small contact uh, and running reasonably moderate speeds, I need kind of low loads. But I, what I want to do is whatever load and speed I need to generate Strybeck curve. Uh, my motion is unidirectional of the shaft. My speed varies from low to liftoff, which is probably going to be 1,000 to 2,000 RPM in this type of a setup. My environment will be my liquid lubricant of choice. Uh, my controlled temperature range, if needed, for uh, VI work or velocity temperature work, uh, probably not to exceed that same range. So that's what I'd simulate in the lab. And I can do this, again, with what I call, it, it's like a pin on disk type setup. I've got a flat disk rotating. That's where I get my velocity. But my pin, in this case, is a cylinder on its side because I'm trying to accentuate that right-hand side of the curve and I want to have liftoff. If I was interested in the left-hand side, I would probably want to use a ball or a hemispherical pin where I don't have as good of liftoff and I can accentuate the boundary conditions or increase the load such that I just stay on the left-hand side uh, for this drive curve. The next application is uh, a, a boundary lubricant characteristics. Again, Strybeck curve left-hand side. So now I've got a steel journal and a bronze bearing. And this is something you might find in a very highly loaded situation. Um, I've got, a, again, a conformal geometry, converging gap. In this case, my roughness is probably a bit more than a hydrodynamic bearing. Uh, initial roughness, surface finish 0.2 to 0.4 micron R sub A. Uh, in this case, my loading can be very, very high, up to 800 megapascals, depending on the application. The specific one I had in mind when I uh, had this example was uh, landing gear on a large uh, uh, transport aircraft. Uh, the bushings there have very heavily loaded. They're running um, almost purely boundary condition. And in this case, they can run um, unidirectional if we're, if we're spinning. Uh, they can also run reversing if we're, our landing gear is oscillating up and down and it's in the suspension system. And the speed is going to vary in that system from 0 to uh, 1,000 RPM, something like that. It's a grease lubricated environment. And my possible temperature range now is defined by aerospace, which is a bit broader than automotive, minus 50 C to 170 C. So we go further on both ends. So ultimately, I'd like to be able to run under these regimes um, once I do the initial screening, probably at room temperature. So I, now I want to define the tribo test. I'm interested in the left-hand side of the Strybeck curve. I want the coefficient of friction. I also want, in this case, what are called the PV characteristics, pressure velocity. So if I have a cer certain load, I can calculate the pressure. And if I'm going a certain speed, I can calculate the velocity. And there's a factor that's been come um, popular in the tribology community. It was started with polymers or plastics. PV is the pressure times the velocity. And, and at some point, that number gets too high and your system conks out. Um, in polymers, it's just a thermal energy input. and You'd often get melting of, uh, of the polymer. But it's also been common to use for uh, when the system conks out a uh, grease lubricated metal system as well. So we're going to look at PV uh, characteristics. And we may also look at wear rate. That's important as well. So same materials, steel journal versus a bronze bushing or a steel pin versus a bronze disc or vice versa. And I can change lubricants uh, or I can change materials depending on what's of interest. My geometry, I get two choices here. I can do a conformal journal bearing. In that case, I'll need a fairly high load, just like the journal bearing in the real application. Or I can use a cylinder on disk or a conformal block on ring, and then I can get away, because it's a smaller contact area, with a more tolerable load or something I can do in the laboratory. I want my same surface roughness for the microgeometry. My loading, again, I need to get up to 150 megapascals, uh, stepwise for PV evaluation, or, or steady for, for a wear calculation. Uh, my motion is either unidirectional rotation of the shaft for a PV or coefficient of friction calculation, or reversing for a wear or a static breakaway coefficient of friction. And I can do a, a wear calculation if I run a certain number of cycles under this. I can calculate the sliding distance and then say, how many takeoff and landings is that equivalent to in the real, real application? My speed will vary from a very small 0.01 to 2 to 3 meters per second to simulate the application. I'd use a grease environment. Uh, and I would try, uh, after my initial screening, to use a temperature influence, in this case probably put the rig in a, in a controlled temperature chamber or locally uh, apply those, those temperatures if I can get to them um, 
within the uh, just the, the tribo test cell itself. Okay, I think this is. Uh, I probably have two more examples in the allotted time here. Uh, this one, this one won't take too much time. An abrasion-resistant coating, of course, it's very popular these days. Most of our cell phones, most of our uh, tablet type of devices have a touch screen, so we're rubbing our fingers on and off. We often see uh, grease or, or, or you know, smut on them. But you can have debris. You can have small dust particles or sand particles, and those can be quite abrasive, so we worry about those particles scratching the glass. Typically, uh, we would want to put a hard coating. Uh, Diamond-like carbon is used very commonly, so that's going to be our material. It's going to be less than 10 microns thick, probably less than 5 microns thick. Um, and that's going to be rubbing, we're going to rub against that either silica or some other dust or hard particles or objects uh, to see the wear resistance or the, the, uh, the fracture resistance, if it's a hard contact, uh, of this coating. So our geometry, in this case we're simulating a uh, you know, piece of sand or dust that's a sharp radius or angular point versus a flat. It's probably an elastic or a hertzian contact. Uh, the roughness of my touch screen is quite fine, 0.05 to 0.1 microns uh, R sub A. Loading is really unknown. Uh, it could be as high as 15 gigapascals if I consider the point. Certainly your finger is not delivering that, but the point of a piece of sand or a particle against that glass could be as high as 15 uh, gigapascals. The motion is going to be linear sliding. It's a fairly short sliding distance. It's likely to be unidirectional and this is going to be under an ambient environment wherever your touch screen is, uh, is existing, probably lab environment. So I define the tribo test with similar uh, to, to simulate that tribo system. I'm going to use the DLC coating just like they put it down. I'm going to use, it's going to be on versus either silica or I'd probably use a diamond indenter because that's the hardest thing I can get and then I can screen materials. I probably have to adjust my load a little bit because of the hardness. I'd use a sharp hard tip, and again, I don't know ahead of time what radius I want. Uh, I have a choice of you know, small 2.5 micron up to 200 micron. That would be a Vickers, uh, uh, sorry, a, a, a Rockwell indenter is a 200 micron radius tip. Uh, depending on my coating thickness and the load I apply, I would choose a tip of that sort. Um, if uh, I want the surface roughness to be the same, I would get a coating sample, a flat sample, just like they'd have in the uh, in the real-life application. In this case, since I don't really know the load, I'm going to run a linearly increasing load until coding failure. And that's very common for these types of tests. And it seems to work very well to simulate the real-life situation. Uh, I'm going to do a linear sliding contact, short sliding distance, unidirectional, unless the sample size and the load gradient, meaning I want a very small gradient or I want overlapping stress fields, then I might have an alternative method, which is something we call the zigzag scratch method. But normally I'd run a, a single scratch of increasing load. You can see that in the bottom there. Uh, and at some point, that, that plot in the very bottom shows um, the straight line is the linearly increasing load, and the uh, line with the step function in it is the coefficient of friction uh, or the frictional force. Uh, so that shows that we've broken through the film, and now we're seeing what's below it. So this is a very nice test to see what is that load at which we've caused the film failure. So that's a very common test to run in the lab for anti-scratch coatings um, on glass, so again, on silica. Um, maybe the last example is, is kind of a fun one here. Uh, we're interested in looking at the action components for a lubricant-free machine gun. And you want a lubricant-free machine gun these days. Um, in the old days, you, you, anybody who owns a weapon knows you need to oil it after you use it or oil it regularly to keep it from rusting. And in humid environments, that's certainly a concern. But in uh, hot, dry, dusty environments, liquid lubricants can uh, attract the dust, and that can lead to jamming of the weapon and cause it to not work. So there was some interest in uh, developing a weapon that did not require any liquid lubricants. And that, that's a tall order. So here, characterizing the tribal system, uh, there's a lot of factors we have to consider, and, and it's, uh, it's a little bit challenging, but we can reduce them down to things we can actually do um, in the laboratory. So our coating uh, that we're interested in, because again, it's a lubricant-free uh, surface we want, it can be up to uh, 30 microns thick, or, or one mil, as we say in English. It can be a surface treatment. It's going to be on some kind of high-strength steel, for example, uh, 4340 steel and it's probably a self-mated 
type of interface, so we'd have the coatings on both halves. And the reason our, our thickness is limited um, is the, the original parts, they, you know, they can't redesign them. So the clearances and the tolerances have to be, you know, within one mil or, or the 30 microns uh, limit there or so. Our contact geometry of this particular in, uh, uh, contact in interface of interest is a cylinder on flat. Uh, and that's, uh, it can be a, uh, against the flat or the flat edge, or it can be just flat on flat. Surface roughness is quite a bit rougher here, or we can tolerate rougher. Uh, typical 0.4 to 0.8, sort of the 32 micro inch in English, or, or 0.4 to 0.8 microns R sub A. Loading can be pretty high. Again, this was Hertzian calculated up to 100 megapascals when we, we sorted out what the contact was. Our motion is linear reciprocating sliding. I'll show you this on the next slide. Uh, it's about a 40 millimeter sliding distance reciprocating. Uh, their desire was a total sliding distance of six and a half kilometers and a speed up to 350 centimeters per second. So this is a very high speed. It's not the barrel velocity, um, but it is, it is the action component's velocity. And again, we have ambient temperature up to 150 C of interest and no lubrication. I'll show you what we thought of for, uh, for the contact is if you can see this, the upper right we show the pin and that pin is on a carrier that's having a linear motion on the slide and that linear motion goes through that spiral cam slot and creates a rotational motion and you can see that that cylinder on the side is then going to be going up and down to be able to, to accept and reject uh, cartridges for example. So we're taking a linear motion, that pin, putting it in a spiral slot creating a rotational motion and the side of that pin, of course, that's our line contact and the slot, it, it can be flat or the edge of the slot. Uh, our flat and flat is the end of the pin against the bottom of the slot. So we have those three geometries we're trying to simulate. So if I define the tribo test, uh, I can have, I'd like to have the sliding wear measured because I need that, that lifetime of six and a half kilometers desired. And I want as low a coefficient of uh, friction as possible. They always say they want less than 0.1. It's not really possible under normal conditions. There certainly are coatings. Uh, we know that uh, DLC coatings under the right conditions with hydrogen and nitrogen terminated bonds can be less than 0.01 in some cases. But normal coatings under normal conditions, 0.1 to 0.2 is about what you're going to live with, if not higher. Um, so we're looking for something under 0.2 as close to 0.1 as we can get. Uh, we put that on uh, high strength steel, 4340 again, heat treated appropriately. Our contact geometry of the three geometries, cylinder on flat or cylinder on the edge of a flat or a flat on flat and that I can do with a three button geometry. The first two I do with the cylinder on flat or on the edge. My surface roughness uh, for the application, I'd replicate that, 0.4 to 0.8 microns R sub A. My loading, I'm going to do some screening here because I'm going to do some lower loads for screening because I may have a dozen possible coatings that could work. You've got soft slippery coatings, you've got hard thin coatings, you've got uh, hard slippery coatings, you've got all kinds there. Um, and you want, to do, you, you want to reduce it down so that your final screening tests are at the conditions of interest, but you can't do all of the tests at all of the conditions. So we'll, we'll go up to 150 megapascal stress motion, we're going to do linear reciprocating sliding, 40 millimeter stroke length, just like the real life situation, uh, unidirectional to achieve a total sliding distance of 6,500 meters or six and a half kilometers. Again, we do the linear reciprocating for looking at, at its behavior and then in order to get the, the total sliding distance, we would run a high speed um, up to 350 centimeters per second unidirectional test because there's no way we can get that uh, uh, six and a half kilometers reciprocating at, at 40 millimeters with the speed we can run in the lab and, and the patience we have to run that, that sliding distance. So those we'd run unidirectional once we did our wear and friction screening in the reciprocating of the appropriate sliding distance. And we'd run ambient for all our screening and then our final test we'd run 150 degrees C. So my test geometry for all these uh, types of samples here is a reciprocating test. You can see on the left I've got a pin on side and I just run that in the middle of the block. If I flip that block over and hang half of the pin over that, uh, that slot there, I can run pin on side slot or side edge 
And in my unidirectional tests, I have my three buttons. Again, I'm very stable. I can apply a very high load and a very high speed and uh, run a three button test to get my uh, very high uh, sliding distance total. And uh, we were successful, in fact, in, in running these types of tests. So the last example, uh, we'll do one from the medical industry here, is a uh, prosthetic hip. And in this case, I'm interested in the wear rate and the coefficient of friction. More so the wear rate than the coefficient of friction. Um, the original hip by Dr. Charnley, uh, he thought the coefficient of friction was the, the factor of interest, so he put a Teflon uh, cup against uh, the, the metal ball, and that uh, unfortunately didn't work out very well at all. It wore tremendously, two to five millimeters in the first year, and all those patients had to have uh, explants and revision surgeries because the thought was low coefficient of friction was of interest. But in fact, we know today where it's the wear particles that get down uh, and cause bone lysis and, and create uh, the need for revision surgery. So we're really interested in the wear rate in this case. But we'll measure coefficient of friction because that's a secondary factor. Our tribal system is in some cases an alumina or a zirconia, uh, which, is, which would be a ceramic coated uh, ball, or uh, more commonly used as a cobalt chrome molybdenum ball itself. Uh, and that, in almost all cases here in the United States, is versus ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. Uh, in Europe, you can get metal on metal, which would be the cobalt chrome moly versus cobalt chrome moly. Um, but let's look, in our case, at uh, ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene because many researchers are looking at how to improve the wear rate of this material by adding all kinds of things like carbon nanotubes and alumina particles and silica particles and diamond particles and, and small things of this sort. So again, we'd like to do screening, but we have to know that our screening tests must, uh, must be only for comparing materials and that the real test has to be done in the HIP simulator, just like the real test on a brake had to be done on the car before you put it on the car here, before you put it in the body, you have to do it on a, in a um, HIP simulator. Those are you know, large expensive tests, which you certainly need to do, but for screening purposes, it'd be nice to do something small scale in the laboratory. So let's see what we can do here. Uh, first by defining the tribal system, and then what kind of uh, tribal tests we would run to simulate that. Our geometry on the macro scale is conformal, so we're going to have a very low contact stress. Uh, it's a ball in a hemisphere. Uh, surface roughness is 0.2 to 0.4 microns on the ball. Uh, the the cup, um, that, that is, since it's a softer material, that takes on a roughness uh, developed by the, uh, the rubbing of the ball. Our loading is variable, and it includes unloading, and that's found to be important. Uh, and the variable uh, direction in the motion is nonlinear. It's reciprocating sliding with cross sliding or rotation. And oh, maybe 20 years ago, they found, or well, perhaps 30, that uh, unidirectional sliding in these types of tests doesn't give the same wear rate as uh, cross sliding or multi-directional or sliding with rotating. The reason being the molecular structure of the polyethylene tends to line up under unidirectional sliding and get stronger. Um, it's weak in the cross direction, but in the, in the direction of sliding you sort of get a, a resistance to wear. If you were to rotate and cross slide, you get a much higher wear rate. So we know unidirectional sliding is not going to work for us here. Uh, we know that thanks to the work of our, of our prior colleagues, but initially people were doing unidirectional, but in this case the, the multidirectional and uh, loading unloading is quite important. Stroke length is going to be about one to three centimeters. Our environment is uh, 37 degrees C, that's body temperature, and uh, synovial fluid is what's in our body. So we may simulate that in, in one round of our testing. We eventually have to get to that, but maybe in our first round uh, we can do something um, less than uh, uh, synovial fluid. So if we define the tribal test, we're going to use the same materials, uh, alumina, zirconia, or cobalt chrome moly, versus our differences in ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. We may, as I said, add different particles to it, and so we would want to screen this. In this case, we'd probably have that as the pin sample in our um, pin-on-plate type test. Our contact geometry is conformal, so we'd have a, a flat-ended pin or it could be nonconformal for, for screening purposes if we want to increase the, the uh, um, uh, surface, uh, increase the stress with a lower load, but it eventually becomes conformal as we get some wear, so one or the other. 
Surface roughness, again, the same as the real way. Uh, what you see in the right-hand side graph there, um, to the right of the loading, um, that is the loading profile and the, uh, um, uh, the displacement. And so what you have in the loading profile is they've actually instrumented people and had them walk. You get a spike uh, in the stress during heel strike, but you actually go negative uh, during liftoff. So you need to be able to simulate that in your lab if you want to simulate the actual uh, motion where you have loading and unloading as well as uh, cross-directional sliding. So you, you could simulate that if you're running under load control, uh, variable loading, including the unloading. Your motion uh, would probably be nonlinear. Uh, you can have reciprocating sliding with either cross sliding, if you have an X and a Y controlled stage, or uh, uh, reciprocating sliding with rotation of the pin. And that's what I've shown here. Um, we would rotate the pin and uh, 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 oscillate the plate back and forth so we get that cross sliding type motion. People have also done figure eight type motions. There's a number of, of, of ways you can do this. Again, you need X and Y control and you can add on top of that the loading and unloading. Stroke length is about one to three centimeters and you would compare the wear in this case. And for screening, again, you probably use saline solution uh, or maybe bovine serum. You can do all those things in the lab and um, get your best materials and then go on to the, uh, the hip simulator. So that's what we can do in the laboratory to uh, simulate uh, uh, the wear of, uh, of a uh, ultra high molecular weight modified polyethylene pin versus either cobalt chrome moly or aluminum or zirconia uh, ball cover. So I think we're getting close to where I'd like to maybe address questions. I just have a couple of slides. One um, is all of these tests I've shown you uh, can probably be simulated on, on a, um, a universal platform type machine. You see on the right many different geometries one can run. I've described most of these in the six or seven examples I've given you. Uh, you need to cover some ranges of loads and environments and configurations and all of those can be done if you run under load and XY motion control with rotation. Uh, if you can do that on one platform, you're in pretty good shape. So with that, I think I will turn it back over to our uh, organizers to uh, see if any questions have come in and I'll do my best to answer those. If we don't get to all the questions in the last 15 minutes, I'll, uh, I'll follow up uh, with uh, questions via email. So please make sure you include your email if you have a question I don't get to. Okay? So I guess I'm going to uh, turn it over back to um, uh, Sarah, if I can do that or you can do that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Or Sarah, yes. sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Thanks. for your excellent webinar presentation on Tribology 101, part 2, you showed several different applications, pretty nice. Hello everybody, I am Suresh Kuri. I don't think we have much time to add these questions. It's already 9 o'clock here, but maybe we can take one or two, but all questions will be answered through email. We have your information and those questions will be answered through email. Uh, let us start with at least one question, very important. Uh, question is, if you are um, in an abrasive wet tester case, one of the examples where you have dealt with abrasive wear testing. Uh, what could be the role of a lubricant and which range of load should be used? Well, uh, <laughs> I, have to plead, I have to plead ignorance in that I'm ignorant of the application. The first question I have to ask the, uh, the questioner is what is the application? If I know the application, I can determine the range of loads. Um, one thing one can do to determine that, uh, and if, if does a lubricant play a role? Sure, it helps clear uh, debris. It helps both carry the abradent into the interface as well as keep the interface cool and carry the abradent out of the interface. And in terms of loading, I, I don't know the application, but we talk about uh, high stress abrasion and low stress abrasion, and that will help us dictate our load in the test. By low stress abrasion, we mean We've carried the particles through the interface, and they, they may uh, dull a little bit or round a little bit, but they maintain their, their initial size. They don't, they don't get crushed, and that's the difference in high-stress abrasion. We define it, at least on our ASTM G2 committee, we define high-stress abrasion as abrasion where the particles are crushed as they go through the interface. So if you can determine whether your 
real-life application is in high-stress or low-stress abrasion, uh, then you can control your load or, or set your load um, to either crush or not crush the particles as they go through. And again, the lubricant serves those three roles, as I said. It, it can carry the particles in to the interface, it can help cool the interface, and it, uh, it can carry them out uh, as well. So it, maybe if you follow up with your email with a little more specifics on the application, um, I can help out with uh, determining a load. And I'm going to ask you all those questions, you know, what, 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 is the, what is the load so we know the contact stress and what is the interface geometry. But uh, hopefully you can do that yourself looking at uh, the, first, the first part of this uh, webinar. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, we, we are running out of time and we will stop it here. We will answer all, all your questions through email. And on behalf of Brooker webinar team, I thank you all once again for joining TMT webinar on Tribology 101 part 2. Uh, at the end, I request you to please fill out the exit survey and we look forward to see you again in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.